wanted to get your opinion in regards to the neuroscience behind that and the and the how it affects us as screenwriters and as creatives. Well, I'm cer- I'm certainly not a neuroscientist, so I, I won't fair enough, presume fair. to go there. I, neither neither but, am I. But from from educated, oh, I, guess. I have several patients I'm going to be operating on later today because you know everybody's got to make a little money on the side, and you, you pay <laughs> Neuros- a lot. I say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but, neuroscience but, is a nice but, side hustle. <laughs> yeah. It, <laughs> Oh, and you could do a series with those, man, <laughs> of multiple surgeries for the same issue. No, um, but there, it is true what I've, I've uh, uh, that our two, talking about the reptilian brain, our two most basic uh, impulses are hope and fear, emotions, mm-hmm. our hope mm-hmm. and fear, okay? Mm-hmm. And, and fear is actually what you're describing, say, in the safe box. Fear is actually stronger than hope. And the, the example that I heard from one uh, psychology professor was, um, that uh, if you are in a restaurant and you get this, you know, uh, fancy restaurant with a wonderful seafood plate, you know, with all this, all the fixings and everything, and you're about to eat it and you see a roach, cockroach in it, that's it, you're done, okay? You're not going there. You're not going to touch it. Contrast that. Suppose you sit down to a meal and it's covered with roaches and you see one, you know, artichoke, <laughs> You're not going to say, yeah, look at that. I got an arm joke out of this. You, you don't. You don't touch it. So that's the example they gave of this hope and fear. Now, something else that's useful that, that we didn't talk about in this book, but uh, it's another thing that I think is useful for when writers work with characters um, is this narrative theory of, of psychological development. Because you're talking about people that stay in the box. Tarantino is different. Mm-hmm. That, that the idea is that we, um, up till age by, by the time we get to age three, we have developed a narrative of our lives. Mm-hmm. And we tend to notice the things that confirm that narrative and ignore the, the facts that don't. And this leads to all kinds of neuroses. I mean, it's like, you know, I'm the one who never was loved, so I'm unlovable. Okay, someone throws himself at you. That's an aberration. That not, doesn't fit, you know. And it's, there was this... Uh, episode of a senator, I forget his name, a Senate, U.S. senator a few years ago, who was caught having sex with men in bathrooms in Minneapolis. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like right. that, yeah. okay, so what What was his story? Well, he was married and he had kids. And he's, he's a straight man, right? Well, that's the story he tells himself. The fact that he's meeting strange men and having sex with them gets ignored in that narrative. <laughs> it's like, oh, I don't know what that is, but that has nothing to do with who I am. What I am is a straight man with a family and all that. And in a way, this this guy's living two different lives. You know, one that he's aware of and one that he's blocked out. I can't speak to him. He's not my patient. I don't know. I'm not a psychiatrist. But you can see that process happening, that it's possible that a guy who's spent 50 years of his life, he's like 60, 50 years of his life, suppressing some reality and constructed a reality in which he was not gay. If he ever came at age 65 to realization that he was gay, that's 50 years of your life that you're a stranger. It's, de- it's, it's, de- it's devastating. It's that's devastating. Crazy. Yeah. Well, well, like, well, let me, should put that away. Yeah, so, le- so, so let me, so let's turn this into something for, uh, for screenwriters in regards to, the screenwriter guys who's listening no because i mean listen i could talk neuroscience all day but the but the concept for for character development this is so powerful and such a powerful tool to use as a screenwriter to get in the psychology and to get into almost the the like just the concept of what we just talked about adding that that sub layer that 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 yeah. uh, that thing underneath it, the that underlining thing of like, I have to stay in this safe box. Perfect example, a guy who's been, you know, 50 years saying I'm married, I have kids, but then I go off. I mean, that's, and, and exploring why he did that. That's a story. That's a screenplay or, or the person who has a, a wife and kids and he's a serial killer, you know, on the side. And we've seen those kind of movies. Like they, they literally compartmentalize, com, compartmentalize, I can't say the word, you know what I'm saying. To compartmentalize. Thank you, sir. Um, <laughs> they're, out there a little bit. Okay. But they but they put their, their worlds in different boxes as almost a defense mechanism uh, for themselves. So someone like this, the, the guy you're talking about, this politician, 
he literally was doing this to protect himself in his mind. Like that's that other story, right. which is his true nature. He couldn't, for whatever reason, the way he was raised, his environment, his his social uh, group or community, wouldn't accept that. So he suppressed it, and now it comes out in this very strange way. Years later, because it can't, you can't hold something like that in. It's not something you can maybe hold it at bay for decades, but eventually it will come out. That is such a powerful, right. a character that's development that's tool. The dissonance between the story you tell yourself about yourself and the reality, when that collapses, that's huge. And the way you can use it in screenwriting, you know, a lot of people like, I think, you know, creating characters, it is it is kind of a mysterious process. People come up with them. Some people are very good at it. Some uh, have more plot-driven or that kind of thing. You know, they divide it that way. Stories and characters are more primitive. But usually people try to write a background about that character. Okay, mm-hmm. he was raised this, he did this, this. and that's useful to, to generate ideas. Um, but the other thing to think about is not what they went through, but what do they tell themselves about what they went through? What is it? Because this is really important when you're, when you're writing a screenplay, when you're even plotting it out. The character doesn't know what the story's about. They think it's about something completely other than what, what it's, you're, the journey you're going to put them on. So where is their head? Where is your character thinking things are going to go? What's the narrative that they're telling themselves while you're plotting, while you're God doing all kinds of things to their lives? Um, so in that sense, to, to give a little thought to this question, when you're thinking about coming up with a character, when you're trying to come up with the specifics of a character, um, what are the, uh, what do they, what do they think about themselves? What's their image of themselves? Uh, and their story, really their story of themselves. And and we certainly, we do exist in story. You know, we, we do that. So, and, and, it's a, and it's a defense mechanism. It's a defense mechanism for our own, you know, just for us to be able to, to continue. To, it's a story. Stories are so powerful that we tell ourselves stories just so we can make sense of this insane thing called life. And I think that's one of the powers yeah. of story. It is a way for art in general is a way for us to process just being alive and just generally. So we're always looking for something to just grab onto. And story is such a powerful thing. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Well, let me tell you uh, some practical things for, for your students, to how to apply this. That um, w- The first lesson of Frank Daniel, I mean, I have it in my notes from the first day of the first class, was that your job as a screenwriter is to turn the audience into keen observers of detail, that you are going to give them clues. And when you give them the clues, you do it in such a way that they're going to anticipate where you're going. And once you've got them anticipating where you're going, you got them. And you can do all kinds of things with that. And that idea was formalized. I studied with him in 79 to 82. Okay. In 1985, uh, a theorist named David Bordwell actually took that idea. Now, he didn't get it from Frank Daniel, he did it himself. Uh, He came out with a book called uh, Narration in the Fiction Film. And it was was very influential in narratology, in the study of narrative in the academic world. And he he applied um, constructivist psychology to how we comprehend movies. That, in other words, we're not sitting back and just absorbing. We're actively involved in anticipating. And that's how we go through life. I was telling you about how we assume things about the world. Well, I can give you clues. I can tell you a simple story now. And, uh, and it's like this. Suppose I, I show you a movie. I, I, uh, you're watching a movie. And in this movie, you have a man and he goes to a, fl- a flower shop and he gets flowers and he puts on the, on the flowers, um, happy anniversary, and he gets a box of chocolate. Okay. And he's, he goes, he's heading home. Meanwhile, his wife gets up, you know, she gets herself all attractive and negligee and all that. And uh, at home, and then she gets out a gun, and she puts the gun in the drawer of the nightstand. Okay, so where are we going with it? I just tell you that much. You got a pretty good idea that he's planning to make love and she's planning to make war. Okay, that's how it's going to read. I can pretty much assume that. Now there may be some people who think, well, I really have no idea what's going to happen. But I think most people are going to say, shit, he's in a lot of trouble. Okay, so then he comes home and presents her with the flowers and chocolate. She reaches for the drawer, opens it up, and says, happy anniversary. And it turns out he's a gun collector, 
And this is the gun that he's been hoping for, and she's been saving for a year to get him this gun, okay? We have a twist. We just, I just told two stories, the one you thought you were seeing and the one you're actually seeing, right? That's all a twist is. But I rely on giving you clues and assuming that the audience is going to put them together. Now, then, I, it, then she takes a piece of chocolate, she gets sick, and dies. And then it turns out he poisoned the chocolate, okay? <laughs> you know, there's another twist. Beautiful. I give you that information. I just I decide what information to give you and what to withhold. And and that's one of the things that, that Danielle mentioned. He said there's really three questions when you're developing a story. When you're in the ideation stage and you're trying to figure it out on the outline stage of beat sheet. Um, the three questions are, of course, what does the main character want? What are they trying to avoid? Okay. The second is, what does the main character know? And what does the main character not know? And the third is, what does the audience know? And what does the audience not know? And based on those three things, that's going to determine how your story plays. And a, a story can be, uh, this, it's, it's a difference between the story and the telling of the story. Uh, or in narratology terms, terms, the narrative, which is the story, and the narration, which is the telling of it. Mm -hmm. uh, another example I could give you, uh, there's this, there's this um, man, he's at the doctor, right? And he tells the doctor, uh, I'm really worried about my, my wife. I think she's getting hard of hearing. Okay. Um, and doc, but I'm afraid to bring it up with her because she's concerned about, you know, maybe she'd be offended. Um, she's getting older and all that sensitive to it. Doctor says, very simple. Go home tonight, get a certain distance away, talk to her in your normal voice and keep getting gradually closer until she can hear you. Right. And then you'll know if there's really a problem because if there's no problem, you'll know. So he goes home and she's over in the kitchen and he's in the living room. You know, the door is open. And he's sitting on the couch, and he just says in his normal voice, um, darling, what's for dinner? Nothing. Okay? So he gets up, and he goes to the edge of the kitchen where the door is open. He says, normal voice, darling, what's for dinner? Nothing. So then he goes into the, right into the kitchen, darling, what's for dinner? Nothing. So finally, he gets right behind her and says, darling, what's for dinner? She says, for the fourth time, chicken. <laughs> so it's like... All right. The story was a man is hard of hearing, but he thinks it's his wife who's hard of hearing. The doctor tells him to go home and do this test. He does the test and then discovers that it's actually he's the one who's hard of hearing. If I tell it that way, you're not going to go. It's not going to go anywhere. Right. But if I withhold certain information, I tell you the same story, but it, it plays differently. So that's one of the uh, elements of, of constructivist psychology you can play with. Um, and it's. Um, it's uh, it's useful to realize too that audiences don't when they go to a movie they don't see a story they see scenes mm -hmm. they see the scenes and they construct the story based on the clues you give them in the scenes that's all they ever see are scenes what? they create the story in their minds and mm -hmm. knowing that you you realize you have this power that you can manipulate anyway I'm sorry go ahead. the, the... The, the master of this, of suspense, of course, is Mr. Hitchcock, which, uh, and I, when, as you were saying the story, I was thinking of Psycho, which was a perfect example of that. He played on the audience knowledge of Janet Lee as a big movie star. And they right. thought, and they went down this road with her, and they're like, well, she's, I mean, obviously she's the movie star. Nothing is going to happen to her. And 20 right. minutes in, she's gone. You know, sorry, right. spoiler, spoiler alert, guys. She gets killed in the spoiler, shower scene. Six years old. Yeah, 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 she gets killed in the shower scene. So now the audience has nobody to hold on to. And now they're handed over to this weird dude at the hotel, at the motel. And now he becomes the main character in the middle, which was completely revolutionary at the time. Yeah. And, and, you know, Wes Craven did it again with uh, Scream in a smaller way uh, at the beginning of Scream as well. Uh, they, they do that, like just kill off the, the, the yeah, but, but the thing is that they carried you along and it was this whole narrative that he, the whole narrative that he was talking about, like the money and she was running and then the cop pulls her over and it was all BS. It, 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 he was completely okay. leading them down the wrong way. I'm like, no, we're just going to kill her. And now it's really about this. That's brilliant storytelling. He played, he played the audience. And I think that's a great, 